sure that you are uh, very nice to her so that she can uh, judge you well. All right. Um, we are missionaries to South Africa. We went there in 2001, uh, just a little bit before the events of 9-11. Uh, we've been there since, and uh, we are in the process of planting a church there in Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, we, are, we have reached the point now where we have some leadership developed. We have some deacons. We have some elders. Um, and so the church is, is developing. We are in... Uh, I'm very encouraged by the development that God has given us, and um, I'm hopeful. I don't know whether it's my will or his, but I'm hopeful that by the end of the next term, we'll be turning that church over to the South African leadership. That's our, that's our goal, uh, if that's the Lord's will. Uh, we're going to continue with our study here in um, the essential attributes. Uh, turn back to Acts chapter 2 uh, as we look at the ingredients, and I'm going to try to run through these Pretty quickly, we looked in the first hour at the, the Word of God as being an essential ingredient. The second thing that we're going to look at during this particular hour is the concept of prayer. And then tonight we'll look at evangelism, uh, witnessing, followed by fellowship, and discipline. Now, as we look at this particular picture of prayer, one of the things that um, I think is pretty evident uh, I don't know if it is for you. It certainly has been a battle for me, but prayer is probably one of the most difficult things for us to do individually. Uh, it was said by one uh, seminary professor that the average evangelical pastor prays for approximately five minutes per day. Now, if an average evangelical pastor battles to get prayer for five minutes a day, what does the person in the pew who is working a 40-hour job and all of the things that you all have to do every day, raising little children and so forth, what kind of a battle is it for you to pray? And yet, we're going to see here that prayer is absolutely essential. Why do we battle with prayer? What is it that you battle with? To pray. What makes prayer so difficult? I'm sure we could answer that in a lot of different ways. For me, I would answer it in two ways. One is, it is first of all a spiritual warfare. Do we have the second sheet passed out? No. no. Okay, well, number one is that it is a spiritual warfare. The evil one certainly knows that it is difficult for us uh, that it, it is difficult for us to pray and he wants to stop us from praying because prayer is a vital element in our Christian walk. One writer says that Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saints upon his knees. For me personally, I think one of the problems I have with, with prayer is that I'm not doing anything. When I'm witnessing, when I'm teaching like I am now, I'm doing something. I'm active. I am thinking. I've put together my message. I've worked together everything, and I'm putting together this message and preaching. And when I'm witnessing to somebody, I'm doing the same types of things. When I'm praying, I'm not doing anything. And that's just a pride issue, isn't it? Because I think that things depend on me instead of depending on God. And really, prayer is dependence upon God. So, if, as you get your sheets, um, as, as it's being passed out here, the, the first answers there will be, the first answer is that it's a spiritual warfare, and secondly, we battle with our own pride. Now, as we look at this section this morning, what we want to think about here, again, if you'll turn in Acts chapter 2, we're going to look at this as the second essential ingredient to a New Testament church. Let's look in verse 42. He says, and they continued steadfastly in, a, in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And if you'll also just jump down to verse 46, I want to compare this with it. It says, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat and gladness with singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added, to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, I want to look at several points about this prayer as we try to consider it together. We're going to look, first of all, at the example of prayer by the churches of Acts. Then we want to look at several different, or two different types of prayer 
And finally, we want to look at the contents of our prayer. So let's first of all notice the, type, the, 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 the activity of prayer or, the, or the, the way in which the church prayed in the book of Acts. Now, if you can connect these two thoughts in verses 42 and 44, it says they continued in prayer in verse 44, and it doesn't specifically mention prayer in verse 46, but since the other concepts are mentioned there, I, I think that we can assume that they were doing these things as well in verse 46. And you'll notice that it says they continued daily. And one of the things I want us to think about as we think about this concept of praying is that it is something that has to be done on a daily basis. It's not something, worship prayer is not something that is done just on Sunday mornings. Okay? It's good that we're here. It's good that you're here. It's good that Pastor Benson led us in prayer and that Adam led us in prayer and Jim led us in prayer. Those are all really good things and we all need to be, be doing that. But prayer can't end when we walk out the back door. Prayer has to be a daily activity. And it's something that needs to be going on constantly in our lives. One writer said they met daily, they won souls daily, they cared daily. The Christian faith was a day-to-day -day reality, not a week-by-week -week routine. We can't walk out of this, this room and, and, and be a different person when we walk out of the room than we are when we're in this room. We need to be individuals who are daily worshiping God. Secondly, it was an activity that was incorporated into the church. Um, one of the things, I'm going to just put some verses up here for you, but one of the things we see, whoops, oh, <laughs> we are back at the beginning somehow. There we go. Okay. Now keep, keep it going a few more. A little further. Okay, one more. There we go. Okay. Now I want you to notice here, watch. This is a really good study. If you just want to do this study on your own, go through the book of Acts. And, and, and read all the places where it talks about their prayer. You'll notice here that, that, that it was just, it was just, it was second nature to them. Okay, it was something that was, that was part of their lives. In Acts 3, it says, Peter and John went up together into temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Um, in chapter 4, verse 29, when they were facing persecution, when they were facing the, the threats that were coming upon them from the Sanhedrin, it says, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak the word. In Acts chapter 6, when they faced, the, the, in, in, in chapter 4, they're facing the threats from without. Here in chapter 6, they're facing threats from within, the, 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 the division that was caused because of the, of the um, the neglect of the widows, it says, but, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. They put an emphasis, and this is what I'm trying to point out, they put an emphasis upon the, the, the prayer. Not just the word of God, they put an emphasis upon the word of God, but they put an emphasis upon prayer as well. Um, this is something that we need, to, uh, we need to understand today. The Lord certainly put an emphasis upon prayer. And it's something he also understood that we battle with. In Luke chapter 18, verse 1, He spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to what? What's our temptation here? What's our tendency here? What do we battle with here? Okay? How many of you have prayed for someone or something for weeks or months or years and you're tempted to quit? Okay? Jesus says, don't quit. Keep going. Don't faint. All right? And that's the idea of this. Um, Jesus sets the example for us in prayer. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Do you, do you, how many of you are busy? I asked this question last message. How many of you are, are busy in your, in your life? Okay? How many of you think Jesus was busy? Okay, read the book of Mark sometime if you don't think he was busy. Okay? Read the Gospel of Mark. He was constantly doing something. Sun up to sundown. 
All right? It doesn't, you know, you, he tries to get a vacation, and he, he ends up ministering in his vacation. All right? I'm probably using new, uh, 21st century terminology, but that would be the idea. He's trying to get away. He's trying to get, get aside. He was taking the disciples aside. He ends up ministering in trying to take them aside, okay, to, to 5,000 people. Um, he was very busy, and yet what? In the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and prayed. Apparently, before the sun came up, before anybody else was up, before anybody could bother him with needs, he prayed. Or Luke 6, 12, came to pass in those days, he went into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer. That is something I have never done. He continued all night in prayer. You see, he put a tremendous emphasis upon prayer. We have a tendency to think, I'm so busy, I can't pray. Martin Luther is quoted as having said to his wife Catherine, I've got a very busy day schedule tomorrow. I need to get up at least one hour earlier than normal so I have enough time to pray. We think that we're too busy to pray. Luther said we're too busy not to pray. And we need to be men and women of prayer if we're going to have a truly New Testament um, church here in Parkersburg. How about the Apostle Paul? Look at Paul's example. I'm trying to multiply these just so we get the point that this is integral with the New Testament. Cease not, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. You ever read those books? You read the book of Ephesians, you read the book of Colossians, you read the book of Romans. How many times does Paul say, I pray for you, I pray for you, I pray for you. The interesting thing is when you get to the book of Romans and he prays for those individuals, he never met them. And yet he prayed for them by name. He had heard of them. He had been told of them. You've never met the people in South Africa, Sergio and Johannes and, and, and Jackie and Justice and their families. And yet you pray for them. I've had several of you already tell me that you get my prayer letters and you, you, you read them and you pray for them. Thank you. You're praying for people you've never met. That's what the Apostle Paul did. And that's how we should approach prayer. So if we want a New Testament church, we want to have a church like the New Testament churches. We must put an emphasis upon prayer. Um, I, I was at, a, at an ordination council one time, and they asked us each to give a word of testimony to the candidate. And the one thing I said to him is, pray more and do less. That sounds like a funny thing coming from a pastor, from a missionary, but it's really true. Pray more and do less. And if we put that into true practice, we would be doing more what the New Testament church was doing. Now, let's move on. We want to move on to the kinds of prayer. And you'll notice here that not only was this something that was um, a daily routine, but you'll notice it says that they were meeting daily and they were meeting from house to house uh, throughout this section. And the concept of this idea is that, uh, notice verse 46, they were breaking bread from house to house, uh, and they did eat meat and with gladness and singleness of heart. This was a, and, and I want to put it this way, there was both a corporate nature to their prayer and a personal nature to their prayer or to their worship. Uh, when I say it was a corporate prayer, I mean that it was a public or congregational prayer time. It's important for us to come together as a congregation to pray. Okay? It, it, you can, you can, we can argue that, that well, I don't, you know, I don't need to be with other people to pray. It's just between me and God. Yes, that's true, but there's a value in corporate prayer. Okay, there's a value in prayer meeting. There's a value in coming together to pray. And I want, us to, I want you to think about this with me um, to, to a certain extent. On your, prayer, on your sheets there, um, number three is that having corporate prayer gives a tremendous unifying effect to the church. Okay? We here in the United States tend to be extremely individualistic. Okay, don't answer this question, but how many of you don't really know your neighbors? 
You know who they know their names. You may even know what car they drive, but you know nothing basically about their lives. Why is that? Okay, it's we're individualistic. We we have our own little thing. We we don't put you here in, in, in America. You don't have fences. I mean, you don't have big walls around your property. We have walls around our property in South Africa for safety safety purposes. I have electric fence on the top of my walls, keeping the the, the bad guys out is the concept. Okay. But we put up fences between ourselves and our neighbors because we never talk to them. We never spend time with them. We're individualistic and we tend to approach church the same way. We tend to look at church as this is my business. I have my life. I come together on Sundays, but I'm not going to expose myself very much because I don't, you know, that's, that's, that's painful. All right? We can't be that way as a church if we're going to be a New Testament church. And one of the areas they, 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 they spent time together with was in the area of praying. And praying has a unifying effect because instead of being all involved in my little situations, I'm involved in our situations. We look at our needs as a church. We look at others' needs. I noticed on your, on your sheets, on your... Um, what do you call this thing? The screen up here, that there were, there were all these prayer requests for different people. Good! That's what we should be involved with. We should be involved in one another's lives. You should take, if you don't, take notes of these people. Write them down. Pray for them on a daily basis. That's corporate prayer. You're involving, you're, in, you're unifying in your effect. Notice in a, in a couple of verses here in Ephesians uh, chapter 3, Verses 14 and 19, to 19, I'm just kind of cutting through some of this. It says, For this cause I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And notice the end of that verse, which isn't up yet. That's not Acts. I mean, that's not Ephesians. Keep going. I figured it out. If I do this real quickly, it comes up. Gary, there we go. All right, notice he says, with all saints. Do you see that concept? We're unified. And look at the unification here. We'll talk about this more in, 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 our, in our message on fellowship. But he says there's one body, one spirit, one hope, one calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. Do you get the message? How many churches are there? One. One true church. I know there's a lot of local bodies. But there's one true church. And when we join together, when you join together praying for South Africa, when I pray for you, when you come together as a, as a congregation and pray, that unifies the church. It brings biblical unity to the church. Number two, it empowers the church. And as we think of this concept, the empowering effect of the church, um, we'll, we'll probably return to this one a little bit later. But as we look at this empowering effect upon the church, you'll notice in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, that it says here that when they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke the word of God with boldness. What happened when they gathered together? They were, they were coming together because the Sanhedrin was attacking. As they were coming together, they prayed for boldness. And what did God give them? Gave them boldness. It empowers them. You see? Do you, do you ever find yourself struggling to be a witness for Christ? Anybody here have that struggle? Okay. Do you, do, you, do you find it hard to stand up at work? Do you find it hard to stand up against an increasingly secular, secular society that is, that is promoting gay rights and, and is really in the effect of doing that is, is demoting Christian rights? Do you find it difficult to stand up in those circumstances and be heard? Corporate prayer is effective in empowering us to be bold witnesses for Christ. That's the concept. Um, and so we need, to, we need this concept to be involved. Now, secondly, as we think about this, not only are we to have corporate prayer, but we need individual prayer. So I don't want to ignore what we just said, but I want to add to it. It's not enough to get together and pray together. We need to pray individually. Um, in Luke chapter 11, uh, Jesus was talking to his disciples, in fact, he was praying. It says it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. 
You see, what was happening there? Jesus was praying individually. He was out by himself. And, and that witness, that example, was, was, was effective in ministering to these other individuals' lives. Jesus prayed individually. And, 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 and let me just challenge, especially those of you who are fathers here in the, in the congregation, or grandfathers. We have a special responsibility to lead our families in worship. It is our responsibilities within the home, especially with children, but also with grandchildren, to lead in family worship. Now, this passage here in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is clearly looking at the, 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 the preaching of the word or the teaching of the word. But it's in the context of the idea of our leading a family worship. And that would also include this area of prayer. And you'll notice the connection here between verses 6 and 7, verses 6 to 8, where he says that we are to teach them to our children, we're to teach them when they rise up, when they lie down, we're, we're, we're to, it's, to be a, it's to be a daily activity, it's to be a personal activity, but notice verse 6. And these words which I command thee this day shall be where? Before you can ever possibly teach them to others, where do they have to be? They have to be in me. Now the same thing is true about prayer. I can tell my kids, I can tell you, Pray, pray, pray. But unless I do it on a personal basis, my words are going to be hollow. You see? And that's the concept that we want to think about in this idea of individual prayer. The Word of God will only be effective if it's in our heart. And prayer is only going to be effective if it's in our heart as well. If it's part of my daily activity. The story is told of D.L. Moody in the Irish Revival where he uh, was in a, in, a, in a meeting on a Sunday morning in Ireland. And as he gave the message, it, uh, sometimes pastors know this, the, it just went flat. Okay, the message just, it just didn't work. Okay, you get, he got done with the message, in fact, and he went up to the, to the, to the pastor of the church and he said... Uh, you know, I think you should get somebody else to preach tonight because I don't know what was wrong, but it just didn't work today. I don't, I, there's something wrong here. And the pastor said, no, I want you here and I want you preaching. That's what we agreed to. It's fine. Unbeknownst to D.L. Moody and to anyone else, there was a sister that was in this church at the time. And the sister went home and she told her other sister who was an invalid and was un un unable to come out to church. She said to her, she said, D.L. Moody was here. And she said, D.L. Moody from Chicago? And she said, yes, D.L. Moody from Chicago. And she said, you should have told me this. I would have been praying for him. Now, I don't want any disturbance. I'm going to lock myself in my bedroom, and I'm going to pray the entire afternoon for the evening service. That night, D.L. Moody came back, and he had power to preach the word. And at the end of the message, he gave an invitation. He says, how many of you would like to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? And 200 people put their hands up. Now, D.L. Moody did something that most preachers wouldn't do. He said, I don't think you understand what I said. Let me reword it. And he reworded the invitation. The same 200 people put their hands up. Still not satisfied, Moody said, if you are sincere about, about this, I want you to meet me by the pastor's study afterwards. 200 people came out to the pastor's study afterwards. Still not convinced, he says, if you really mean it, I want you to come back tomorrow. And 400 people came back the next day. And it was the beginning of the Irish revival. Where did it come from? Probably the sister that was an invalid praying. How important is prayer? We need it to be corporate. We need it to be personal. Point number two. I'm never going to make it. Just if you see little kids running out there, forget them, okay? The content of prayer, that's a good pastoral thing to say. Uh, the content of prayer, let me run through this pretty quickly. And I want us to think about this idea together. We talked, we, in the first message, we alluded to the health and wealth um, groups that teach the, that, that we should have health and wealth in this life. And we rightly um, criticize those individuals. But I want you to think about this with me for a second. When we pray for people, 
When we as a church pray for individuals, when we as individuals pray for people, what do we normally pray for? Can I suggest to you that we normally pray for health and wealth? Now, is there anything wrong with praying for health and wealth? No. As long as that's not all we pray for. Is God sovereign? This is one of those rhetorical questions that everybody's supposed to say yes upon. Okay. Is God in control of all things that happen in our lives? Yes. So did God allow that sickness or that unemployment situation to take place in my life? Yes. Why? Because he doesn't like me. I'm just seeing if anybody's still awake with me. No. He's got a purpose in that action, doesn't he? He has got a spiritual purpose. What is God trying to do? He is trying to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ, right? Do we believe that? Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and, and 29. He is conforming us to the image of His Son. How does He do that? Well, one of the ways He does it is through trials, through sickness, unemployment. You see? So when you pray for someone with cancer or you pray with, for someone who has a, a, a physical need or a job need, Please pray for those needs, but please don't stop there. Pray that God will use that in their lives to develop them into more Christ-likeness. Or, if they're unbelievers, pray for them that God will use that to get a hold of their hearts, not just that they'd be, fe they'd be feeling better. All right? That's the key in this, in this particular area. And too often, we are like Jacob instead of like Joseph. You remember the story of Jacob and Joseph? Remember that Jacob, when all the brothers came back and the one brother wasn't there and they opened up their money bags and the, and the, and the money was in, I mean the food bags and the money was in the bags, Jacob says, oh, all these things are against me. Remember that story? He didn't read Romans 8.28 very well, did he? Of course, he didn't have Romans 8.28, all right? But he, he should have known it. He should have known it. And the reason I say that is because at the end of the book of Genesis, when Joseph facing the exact same set of circumstances, he said, not all these things are against me. He said, you meant it for evil, but God for good. Now, can I suggest to you that there are very few people, with probably the exception of the Lord Jesus Christ, that have ever faced the unfairness that Joseph faced? from his own brothers. And yet he looked above the problems and looked at the God above the problems. That's what we need to do in, in, in our life in general, but in our prayer. Look at other people's needs, but don't stop with those physical needs. Don't be distressed and say, all these things are against me, or all these things are against them. Rather, pray for them. Pray that God will be using those things in their lives to develop them into more Christ-likeness. I am completely abandoning the, the video here, so you don't need to worry about that at this point. Now, how do we do this? And let's just close with this thought. Um, I, since I'm off the video, I'm going to turn to Romans chapter 12, off the PowerPoint rather. And I want you to look with me in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And we're just going to consider this verse, and then we will um, draw this to a close. When we think about this concept, and we, we talked about, I, I, and let me just, let me back up just real quickly. When you face problems in life, just answer this to yourself. Do you treat things more like Jacob did or more like Joseph did? Is, what's, what's your tendency? Do you tend to look at, the, at, at God's work in the situation or do you tend to look at the, the difficulties that you're facing and the problems you're facing? Which is your focus? Okay, that's what I'm trying to get you to think about. Now, which is the proper focus? Obviously, Joseph's focus was the proper focus. But we all tend to be like Jacob and looking at how things are against us. 
or as we looked at that message in the first message, we talked about the feeling-oriented versus the word-oriented approach to, to life. We all tend to be feeling-oriented. Now, what has to change? Well, look here in Romans chapter 12, and notice with me here. It says in verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? What brings about transformation? The renewing of your mind. There has to be a change of our thinking process. All right? There has to be a renewing of the mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, if we look at verse 12, first of all, I want us to think about this. When we think of worldliness, we tend to think of actions. I don't chew, I don't smoke, I don't go with girls that do, okay, that, however that goes. Uh, we, I just blew it. But anyway, you, we have that type of a, of a thought, okay? We have those kinds of things we think of that outward actions. I don't drink and I don't smoke and I don't do this and I don't do that, therefore I'm not worldly. What does Paul say is the source of worldliness? It's our thinking. It's the way we approach life. It's the way we think. We think feeling-oriented. We think unbiblically-oriented. Worldliness isn't so much what you do. It's what you think. Okay? And there needs to be a transferal of that. There needs to be a, ref a reforming of that or a renewal of that. But notice what he goes on to say here. He says that you may prove, that you may, uh, that word prove literally means approve. What is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Now, let, let me just close with this thought. When cancer comes, when job loss comes, is it fun? Of course not. If you're told by your doctor you have terminal cancer, we just heard yesterday of a, of a friend that has less than a year to live, okay? Those are hard things on us. Those are difficult things. But what does it say here? The renewing of your mind causes us to approve of that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What's involved there is this. What is involved is the concept of submission. It's submitting to what God has for us. It's submitting to the will of God in our situation. Jesus put it this way. When he faced Gethsemane, when he was in Gethsemane facing the cross, he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And just summarizing all of this and bringing it together now. When I'm dealing with that cancer, I am allowed to pray, Lord, if it be your will, may this cup pass from me. But I must follow it with, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That is the key for us as believers in Christ. If we're going to pray properly, we first of all need to be praying daily, we need to be praying corporately. We need to be praying individually. And as we pray, we need to focus not only on the physical needs, but on the spiritual needs. And we need to bring it all into conformity to the Word of God and to the purpose of God. May we count ourselves as sheep for the slaughter, given to His service, not for ourselves. Let's pray.